Some interesting statements there from the Prime Minister of India, including uh, uh, the, the, the announcement that they will not let any third party misuse the open border between India and Nepal. Wonder who he would be referring to. But there's uh, the elephant in the room called China. China has pumped in a lot of money into Nepal. And uh, Nepal's government has recently rejected a multi-billion dollar Chinese power project. We're talking about the two and a half billion dollar Budi Gandaki hydro power project. It will not be given to the Chinese company Gezuba Water and Power. It has been awarded, uh, had rather been awarded in 2016 by the previous Maoist government of Prime Minister Prachand to this Chinese company without competitive bidding. Global tenders are likely to be called soon. At this stage, it's too early to say if Indian firms will bid. But uh, this message to China is still being seen as significant. The Budi Gandaki flows 50 kilometers west of Nepal's capital Kathmandu. The source of the Gandaki River is on the Tibet border. This is one of Nepal's three major rivers. It has a catchment area of more than 46,000 square kilometers. Much of it is in Nepal. A dam is planned on this river for water storage to alleviate Kathmandu's drinking water problems. It will also generate 1,200 megawatts of electricity, something that Nepal desperately needs. The total cost, when completed, may touch up to $3 billion. Water cooperation between Nepal and India does not have a happy history, we can tell you. There have been agreements signed on major rivers like the Kosi, the Karnali and the Mahakali, essentially for large hydroelectric and irrigation projects, but no project except the Kosi Barrage has been completed. So a very bad record there. Smaller rivers have been ignored. If one counts all the rivers, streams and water courses, India and Nepal share 6,000 of them, 6,000 water bodies. Most are too small to catch the attention of policymakers in either country, but they are vital for the people who live along their banks. The India-Nepal Friendship Treaty of 1950, which established special relations between the two countries, did not set up any overarching principle under which issues like water sharing on transboundary rivers could be worked out. So Narendra Modi clearly there banking on faith and diplomacy to regain lost ground in Nepal. Will he succeed is the million dollar question. To some extent, yes. But China sees strategic value in Nepal not only as a buffer to secure Tibet's frontiers, but also as a route to reach the Indian market. Nepal is on board China's Belt and Road Initiative and China is making other steady inroads into that country, including its army. The colour and spectacle in Janakpur makes for great optics. But it also underscores India's need to leverage every card it has to keep Nepal in good humour. In a trend visible since 2008 when disturbances in Tibet saw China's interest in Nepal as a buffer deepening, India is now having to compete with China for Nepal's affections. With Belt and Road, the new Chinese mantra, Nepal is the gateway to the billion-plus Indian market. Nepal wants to show its geographic advantage and be a link between China and India. The bridge linking two big neighboring countries and be a beneficiary from our development. I think this is a logical desire. China's foreign ministry can be accused of putting words in Nepali mouths. But he was being honest about Beijing's strategy to overcome India's distaste for the Belt and Road Initiative. China would take advantage of Nepal's open border with India to ensure its goods reached India. It's attempting the same by tying up a free trade agreement with the Maldives and pushing Sri Lanka hard on the same demand. The point China keeps emphasizing to South Asian leaders, China has come to stay. I believe that China, Nepal and India, these three countries, have always been natural friends and partners because we are three neighbouring countries connected by the same mountains and rivers. No matter what the international situation is and whatever individual changes might happen within each of us three countries, this basic fact will not change and it cannot change. So what are the challenges before Modi? He has an uphill task before him. He has to overcome doubts and suspicions about his role in the 2015 economic blockade. He has backed the new Nepali constitution even though it's unfair to the Madesis. Finally, he has to set up the pace of India-aided development projects. Modi also has to answer the question, is all this enough?
even assuming Modi is able to win the trust of Nepali leaders and gets all the stalled development projects moving towards completion, will it be enough to keep the Chinese on the sidelines in Kathmandu? Indian diplomats who've served in Nepal believe it's too late. The Chinese are now players in Nepal and India has to manoeuvre around it. Let's also talk about China's footprint in Nepal. It's already on board the Belt and Road Initiative. The Chinese investment is nearly $80 million against India's $36 million. There is talk of a Nepal-China friendship treaty already and a Chinese company is providing internet services in Nepal. A major concern for India is the Nepal Army. Last year, China offered Nepal $32 million as grant assistance. Earlier in 2011, China agreed to give $7.7 .7 million in assistance, increased the number of seats in its war college for Nepal Army officers and is clearly building a constituency among them. Sections of the officer corps reportedly believe that democracy in Nepal should be of the Bangladesh kind, where the army plays a stabilizing role. There is even talk of ending the recruitment of Nepali Gurkhas into the Indian Army. Bureau Report, Beyond.